So I think uh, there are several options that the powers behind the throne will attempt. One is a cyber attack. Two is an escalation of the war, either or both in Europe and the Middle East. What we do know, what we have written about since the middle of May, is that in early May, there was a NATO meeting in a Baltic uh, country in which the NATO guys told the government representatives that we are planning <clears throat> to attack Russia. Good afternoon or good morning in my time. Simon Hunt, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And yourself? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for coming back on. Uh, we've had a lot going on since you've been on. It's been about uh, it's been about two and a half months. We've had a uh, when we you were on previously, we talked about war and that's continuing and, and that's escalating, not de escalating, it seems like. We talked about things that could go wrong and black swans, if you would. And then we just recently had an assassination attempt on uh, the former president, then the front runner for president. We had uh, the current president resign or step down, not run, I should say, but we could, he's probably more than likely forced to res uh, s stop running. And then we had, uh, we talked about cyber attacks. And then we had CrowdStrike happened um, not even a week ago. So let's start with all of that. What do you expect? What was that that had just happened? I think probably um, the Microsoft failure was a cyber attack. It was a dress rehearsal, probing where the weaknesses are. Who mounted it? That's a big question. I don't know the answer. All I, all I can say is that company is known to have had or to have strong relations with the U.S. intelligence community. So who knows? But it was a dress rehearsal. Address Russell. Yeah, ahead. I think that there will be a proper cyber attack which will shut down bank computers, airline computers, national grid computers, hospital computers, basically shutting down uh, the entire system. I think that is a high risk that we will see before the end of September. Why before the end of September? Is it because of the election coming up? Yeah. I think that the group who control the levers of power behind the throne are so desperate to stop President Trump from regaining the White House, that they will do almost anything, if not everything, to prevent that from happening. I think it's safe to say that uh, the assassination attempt was an attempt on his life, and it it's pretty clear he was a very, very lucky man in that he turned his head at the last minute. Otherwise, he wouldn't be in the race. Um, so I think uh, there are several options that the powers behind the throne will attempt. One is a cyber attack. 
do is an escalation of the war, either or both in Europe and the Middle East. What we do know, what we have written about since the middle of May, is that in early May, there was a NATO meeting in a Baltic uh, country in which the NATO guys told the government representatives that we are planning <clears throat> to attack Russia. So what we heard just a few days ago is that part of Russia's preparations is that they are building prefabricated hospitals right across the country. What's that telling you? I think here in the Middle East, it's very likely that Israel overtly or covertly supported by America and the UK will launch a blitz against Hezbollah. What's interesting is that the president of Syria either, I don't know whether he's still there, but has been the last few days in Moscow. It's interesting that Assad and Erdogan are mending fences brokered by Russia. So I would not rule out possibility. It's not a forecast, but a high risk that we will see turmoil in the Middle East, in the region where I live, namely Dubai. The consequences, if that does happen, the consequences are enormous. I don't have to spell them out. But you've got a coalition of forces on the one side lined up to support Israel and on the other side lined up to support Syria and indirectly Hezbollah. Where does uh, this, the implications, even if it's not war, the implications on markets are going to be huge. First of all, America, if, it, if the country is not already in recession, will very soon be in recession when you look under the hood of the published data, which Increasing, a lot of it is increasingly being manipulated. So uh, you will have not a resilient, strong US economy, but one that is either in or heading into recession. You can see globally that the services sector, which is propped up, economic activity in most countries in the second quarter is turning over and manufacturing, which let's face it, is the powerful sector that provides permanent jobs. And that remains weak and in certainly in recessionary trends, both in America and in Europe. 
China, China's leadership is more concerned with stabilizing the economy, putting a, a flaw under it rather than stimulating it. It has no wish to follow the monetary policies of the West. So the focus is on manufacturing, industry trends, and from that we get employment that follows. But there's going to be no real stimulus. So probably China's GDP will more or less be the same figure as last year. Might be a little bit less, unlikely to be um, any better. So we look at for China, we look at nominal GDP, not real GDP, because those numbers are also played around with. Nominal GDP last year was 4.7%. I'd expect to be more or less the same this year. So really what we're saying is that uh, between now and the early months of next year, the dominating trend will be recession. And that has huge implications for a highly valued equity markets around the world. And we expect by, say, March next year, that equity markets globally will fall, will have fallen by 30 to 40 percent, which, of course, of course, that will shake out base metal markets. So we would expect similar falls for base metals like copper. The other side <clears throat> of the picture, we will continue to see gold being bought as gold really is the safety valve to tense geopolitics, and cleared currencies. I think it won't be long before China will announce that its currency is being supported by the gold that its citizens own, which on the last count was 25,000 tons plus. Then you have to look at what is BRICS coming up with. There's a paper prepared by a Russian and a Chinese economist that will be discussed at the BRICS summit meeting in August. On the <clears throat> basis of that paper is that 40% of the proposed new currency will be gold, and 60% will be local currencies of member countries, but linked to gold. So BRICS will be producing a currency that sees gold coming back into the monetary system of their member countries. 
this probably doesn't happen overnight. It'll be a step-by-step -step approach. But the trend will be pretty clear. Now, of course, America and its allies will hate to see this because it completely undermines their own system, the fiat currency system. And then what does that do to the dollar? If you've got a large chunk of the world not using the dollar for trade and investment purposes, that's a huge loss of dollar for power. So again, it comes back to the original premise that the people controlling the levers of power in Washington simply do not want to see bricks maturing into a real rival to their own system. Comes back. Whoa. It's, I mean, what, coming to the end of the American empire, like most previous empires, they always end in war. I think the one that escaped the war scenario was Great Britain. We had the sense to negotiate our way out of the empire. But we've been left with the sense that we still have it. So the real issue, the next issue, of course, is what happens when most of the world is in recession. And we're seeing these really tense global situations that have either flared up or are about to flare up with the possibility that we will have had a cyber attack or something even worse. What's going to be the response? We will have a new government in America. Response is bound to be mountains of fiscal and monetary stimulus. So what we see evolving from the early months of next year into either late 2026, early 2027, we have a very inflationary environment accompanied by a falling dollar, rising energy prices, and rising food prices. Well, the sort of global inflation that we will see will probably be <coughs> 13, 15%. And in America, not far short of that. The problem then is, what will the bond vigilantes do? And inflation at double-digit numbers. You can see, for instance, 10-year U.S. Treasuries yielding over 10%. What does that do? to a highly leveraged system. We have so 27, five odd years of either rolling recessions or depression. And it's not until uh, the early 2030s that political heads are not together that Debt has been expunged from the system. 
that future growth will be based on productivity. And as a result, we then start seeing 20, 30 years, 40 years of growth, global growth that will average what we've seen the average was since 1900, which was around 4%. That's when we get the real bull market, the secular bull market for base metals. Before then, it's very volatile, down first, then up very sharply, and then crash. And then it's the early 2030s, not today, that the secular bull market starts. Sorry if I've disappointed your listeners, but that's the way we see it. You didn't disappoint me. Um, where does the yen carry trade in Japan come in this calculus? I think it's part of it. And is that happening I now? I think this is what Anabe is saying, looks around the world and says, whoa, I don't like what's happening around there. I want to put the, uh, my arms around my own money. So they bring it back home. I think that's, I think that's much more the case than, um, yield differentials between the U S and Japan. So no so expert, but apparently the big institutions, the big pension funds, if as is probably as is very likely to happen, if not this meeting, the following meeting, the BOJ raises rates to the point where pension funds can get one percent. We'll go for it. So I think the big story is Mrs. Watanabe. She looks outside Japan, sees chaos, and says, I want my money back. And that would further put pressure on U.S. equities as well as... Yeah, sure. sure. As well as the bond market. Yeah. So another question that I have is... You see, and I, I share your thesis, I think we're probably already in recession is my thesis, but do you see strong oil prices going into the new year, or I should say a floor on oil prices? Work that out for me. Well, clearly the Biden administration would like to see weak oil prices in front of the election. Right. So the extent to which through the derivative markets that they can prevent oil prices from rising is a moot point. But certainly beyond November, particularly if we see the war in the Middle East truly escalating, then we will see oil prices by the end of next year at $150 to $200. Dollars. You're harsh. Well, it's very simple. If, which is what Israel wants to do, and if not overtly, covertly supported by the US and the UK, they launch a hit on Iran. Iran is already prepared for it. They've mined the Hormuz Straits. Only needs a click of a button to shut the Straits down. What does that do to oil prices? 
triple digits. Yeah. And what does that do to food prices? Food prices, they're going to be in short supply. Weather conditions, particularly. Already in parts of the world, you're seeing food shortages. Let's go back to um, the assassination attempts on, on Trump. Do you see another attempt happening, possibly, God forbid, or? I, as I said, right at the start, powers behind the throne will do everything and anything to stop Trump getting into the White House. However, if they tried another attempt on his life, it would be too obvious. So my conclusion, my guess, it's not a conclusion, my guess, is that either through a cyber attack or through COVID number two, or war, the election won't be held or will be postponed. So you really don't expect either there be an election or Trump to be in the White House next year? If Trump gets into the White House, dare I say it, it'd be almost a miracle. These guys will stop, won't stop at anything. Why did they try an assassination attempt? in the first place. It's a sign of their desperation. Yeah. The next question I have with everything that you said is why, in your opinion, does Israel want to continue to escalate everything? Are they being prodded by the U.S.? and, and No, I think it's the other way around. I think that the leadership fears that if it's not now, it will be in the future. Another bigger attempt to destroy the state of Israel. So they are concerned about survival. And who is the enemy? Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis, and the head of the state, Iran. Why did, what was the real reason that Netanyahu went to Washington? I suspect it was to get Washington support for a blitz on Hezbollah, knowing that this would then bring Iran and Russia into the equation. So look at it from another point of view. I'm thinking out of the top of my head. America has used, has always used Israel as its centerpiece to influence Israel's Arab neighbors. So what if they now see the UAE and Saudi Arabia joining BRICS, Saudi starting to accept oil payment in, in currencies other than the dollar, and even in the one, which they immediately convert into gold, the UAE also doing small deals, payment in, not in dollars, 
they're in America's influence will disappear. The Gulf countries have matured enough to look after their own affairs. They don't want to be told what to do. So slowly, step by step, you're seeing them breaking away from America. The big question is, when do they tell America to close down their bases in Qatar, UAE, and Saudi Arabia, and get the hell out of our countries. I think that will come, it's my guess only, but that will come in a big crisis, like the Iran war. So in a Iran war, well, if Israel struck America, UK, make a hit on Iran, it's a war. Yeah, you get really, really high oil prices and you get a lot of people dying. Think of the economic consequences. Yeah. What's uh, China's involvement in all of that? That's a very good question. China, there was recently in Beijing a meeting with the PLA, the different factions of the PLA, representatives from the Gulf countries, putting forward a two-state solution. Problem is, from Israel's point of view, a two-state solution is no go. Absolutely no go. So, China, which has big investments in Iran, will be part of the Gulf countries' support for Iran. I keep coming back to when, in October, Hamas hit Israel, and in November, MBS and Saudi held a summit meeting. And he greeted first president of Iran in open arms, televised, and then Erdogan. That sent, to me anyway, a big message which follows, of course, what China broke it, a peace deal between Iran and Saudi. In all of this, would China make a move then to Taiwan? Because it seems like there's a lot of chaos, and it, that's the time to make a move, right? I, I don't think so. I think only if America crosses all the lines, like sending of offensive weaponry into Taiwan. Will China make a move? And then it won't be an attack, it'll be a blockade. Why wouldn't they attack? What's holding They're them back? Attacking their own, because in their eyes, they'd be attacking their own citizens. Right. What does a blockade do? Taiwan needs everything imported. Yeah. And if you've got a blockade, you can't export. That crashes our economy, obviously, and crashes our economy because we can't get computer chips yeah. out. <laughs> uh -huh. So, really, <laughs> I'm just, these are my conclusions, but I think you're alluding to what needs to have 
a lot of gold and a lot of food stored up, correct? Gold, food, and water. And water. And get the hell out of a city, right? And the question about <laughs> gold is where you store it. Yeah. Oh, man. It's interesting. I, I love talking with you, but I also kind of hate it. <laughs> it's so darn interesting and so stimulating. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's like it confirms, confirms my worst fears. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't enjoy putting forward these theses, but it's when you put the dots together that the conclusion is clear. Yeah. What, what is, it's the complete opposite to what? The consensus is thinking, the titans of the financial community, the banks, the brokers, the funds. I'm sure some of them feed it in their bones, can't express. I think the interesting question is, what is big family money doing now? Yeah. I don't know, but I suspect that on every rally they are selling. What then are they doing with their liquidity? Where is that going? And into what? Precious metals seem to be supported at these prices. I'm sure there's one avenue. Yeah. I'm sure food is another. So I guess, um, if there's one thing you gave us so much last time we left, you said, Andy, you just wars escalating, cyber attacks going into recession, black swans expect the unexpected because that's what's happening. Is there one thing? from now until the end of the year that you would say to be aware of? The unexpected event, whether it be a cyber attack or war, which creates mayhem in global markets. And we already had one. Yeah. But then to look at the optimistic side, which is early next year, when to stop a systemic collapse, governments and central banks flood the system with liquidity, and then you will get more or less a doubling in equity indices from where they fall in early months of next year. Take the S&P 500, we have it down to below 3,000. So you will see over six by late 2026. Because of all the liquidity. Yeah, it's inflation. Interesting. I would agree with you. I would that agree. somebody does. <laughs> I would. Not I many of those, I can tell you. Yeah, I do. It's, um, it's interesting. It's like trying to look at a 4D chessboard and see what the next moves are. 
I don't play chess, so I don't know. Yeah, I do. That's that's what I equate it to. Well, Simon, um, we'll wrap it up then. I've taken way too much of your time. I um, it's I been a pleasure chatting. If if anybody wants regular updates, I can be contacted on Simon dash hunt dot com. And you're very responsive. You're very responsive. So I think I thank you for that. I'll link to that everything in the show notes below this, as well as on the podcast. Thank you so, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Simon. Pleasure. Great to chat. It is my pleasure. Take care. Cheers. All the best.